In the last unit of this lecture, we're going to talk about data preprocessing and weight initialization. Let's start with data preprocessing. Remember again what happens for positive inputs x. Right? So here we have the an activation function g of a linear layer, and if you know the activation function is the gradient of the activation function is uh, positive, which it is for most activation functions, and all the axes are positive. This means that these blue terms here are positive. And that means that all gradients here have the same sign, which is the sign of the upstream gradient L with respect to G. Right. Um, we've seen that this leads to the requirement for the activation function for being zero centered, but it at the same time leads to the requirement for the input to be also zero centered, right? Same should hold not only within each individual layer, but also for the input itself. And that's why um, the data set is typically pre-processed before being fed into a neural network. And the most common pre-processing is, is the zero centering, where we just take each element and subtract the mean. So we compute the mean um, uh, for each data element along each dimension in this case, it's a two-dimensional data set. So we compute the mean over x1 and over x2. This might be here. And then we're subtracting the mean to zero center the data set. Now this data set has the mean at zero, zero. We can further normalize the data, which is also, also sometimes done if the input is in a very um, exotic range. And we can normalize the data such that the standard deviation is one by dividing by the standard deviation. Yeah, so you do this after you have zero centered um, the data set you, you apply this normalization. You can also decorrelate the data by multiplying with the eigenvectors of the um, empirical covariance matrix, or you can whiten the data by um, using the square root of the eigenvalues of the covariance matrix for um, dividing the elements of the data set. You can see this is kind of applying PCA to um, the data. You can see um, that in this case, the data is, is very well distributed. It's zero centered. There is no correlation visible anymore because the correlations have been, like the, has, the data set has been decorrelated and it has the same variance or standard deviation in each dimension. So here's another intuitive explanation of why zero centering or pre-processing of the data is actually a good idea. Um, in this case, we want to distinguish the red from the blue uh, from the green class here in this two-dimensional domain. And uh, as you can see, if the data set is not zero centered and I do a little change to the decision boundary, let's say I rotate it by five degrees, I uh, suddenly make a, a very uh, strong um, mistake, a large mistake on the classification. But if the data is zero centered and I change the decision boundary slightly, then uh, this does not happen as much, right? And this is how you, I mean, it's just an illustration, but it's how you can think about it. Okay, um, so while whitening can be used, it's actually quite uncommon to use. It's not, people found it's not really necessary. What's really necessary is to use zero centering. And that's why, for instance, AlexNet, which is one of the networks that we're going to see in, in the later lectures, is subtracting the mean image, computing the mean image over all the input images and subtracting the mean image. VGGNet subtracts only the per channel mean. So it's only three numbers that are calculated, the three mean values and subtracting those. ResNet subtracts the per channel mean and divides by the per channel standard deviation. So there's some differences amongst different deep learning architectures, but in general, they are doing some form of zero centering. Okay. 
The second important thing that we need to uh, take into account is how we should actually initialize the weights for training. Let's recap quickly um, how we do the training. So we have learned the stochastic gradient descent algorithm, which is the standard algorithm for training neural networks as, for instance, an MLP, where we initialize the weights W, we pick a learning rate and a mini batch size, and then we draw random mini batches. And then for all elements of a mini batch, we do forward propagate um, the inputs to calculate um, all the activations and the output. And then we back propagate the gradients from the loss function again to obtain the gradient of the loss functions with respect to the parameters W. And we update the gradients um, based on the average of the mini batch gradients. And then we iterate until the validation error um, uh, increases again. Now the question of course is, well, this algorithm is simple and easy, but how do we initialize the weights? And there's really many of them, right? So in an MLP, depending on how many neurons you have, if you have 100 neurons in each layer, then even if you just have two hidden layers, you have already 100 times 100 um, connections or weights. <clears throat> so it's a, it's a huge, can be a huge number, it can be in, in the order of millions or hundreds of millions of weights that you need to initialize. And it's actually quite important that you initialize them correctly, otherwise training will not proceed. So <clears throat> let's look at this uh, neural network again that we've seen many times throughout this lecture. And we are now concerned with these red boxes here. These are the layers of the neural network, two hidden layers and the output layer, and they all have parameters. And we wanna initialize these parameters. The simplest solution for initializing these parameters is to set all the network parameters to a constant, say zero or some upper constant. What happens in this case? Well, if we set all of them to zero or to some constant, then learning is not possible. And the reason for this is that all units of each layer are learning exactly the same. Right? So if I forward propagate um, information through this network, then all of the layers are actually doing exactly the same because we have been initialized the same. And if I then back propagate the gradients, they will change, but they will change exactly the same way such in the next, such that in the next forward pass, they will again do all the same. Each neuron in each layer, all of these 100 neurons here, will do exactly the same. So this is not useful. There's not some interesting model appearing that is doing some interesting representation learning. This doesn't work, unfortunately. It would be convenient, it would be nice if it would work, but it doesn't work. Yeah, so now let's consider um, in the following slides, let's always consider a multi-layer perceptron where we specify a single layer as a composition of an affine transformation with parameters A and B and an activation function G. And as we've seen on previous slides, the gradient with respect to AI is given by, so the gradient of the loss with respect to AI is given by the loss with respect to G. This is the upstream gradient coming in and the local gradient from G <clears throat> sent uh, um, to uh, AI, which is um, G with respect to X. And then this inner term here is X, X with respect to AI, which is just XI. So I've just directly written XI here. This is the same equation from the previous slide. And uh, for G, we will consider only the TANH and the ReLU activation functions in the following. So <clears throat> let's start with the TANH activation function. The simplest, naive, more, most naive thing we could do that goes beyond setting all the weights to the same constant value is to sample them randomly. For instance, from a Gaussian distribution with a small standard deviation, let's say sigma equals 0 0.01. The problem with this is that the activations in deeper layers will tend towards zero. I've plotted this here 
on the top. You can see this is the, the histogram of uh, the frequency of or the activations. So this is just plotting all the activations. This activation means the um, the function, the activation function outputs of the first layer. Plotting all of the activation function outputs. I'm using, I think, 100 or 200 neurons here per layer. So I'm plotting this for um, a, a random data set with 500 samples. I'm plotting all these activations in a histogram, and this is what comes out. You can see, um, as expected, it looks like a, a Gaussian. Now, when I when I take this and I pass it to the next layer, then as you can see, the standard deviation of this distribution decreases. And it decreases very quickly. Already after the fourth layer, it has all collapsed to one point. And the reason is that we are um, that we have drawn all of the weights with a small standard deviation, which means that they are gonna be multiplied over and over again with small numbers. And so the uh, values that were initially large are gonna decrease and decrease and decrease with every layer because we are multiplying small values in the linear layers. In other words, uh, this is um, what's happened, uh, what I've illustrated here, the um, loss function with respect to AI, if we, if we think now about the backward pass, is also um, tending towards zero because we have now um, this, um, you know, for one particular layer, the upstream gradient times um, the local gradient. But because here in the last layers, the local, uh, the, the X values, the inputs or the outputs of the last layer are so small that we can consider them to be equal to zero, we're not even propagating the, the uh, gradients further. So we're, the gradients are stopping already at the, at the penultimate layers here. So we're not pro propagating any further. So there's no learning happening. So that doesn't work. What happens if we increase the standard deviations? In this case, I've plotted the same thing, but now I'm drawing the weights from a Gaussian with a large standard deviation, sigma 0 0.2. What you can see in this case is that all activation functions actually saturate. And the reason is that I've, I've basically um, used a linear layer that now increases um, the spread of the data. And it increases in a way such that the sigmoid functions, they saturate there. The, the values are, are so large that we're ending up in this saturation regime, either negative or positive of the sigmoid. And that's also why, what you can see here in the activation outputs. We have most of the weight focus on uh, minus one and, and plus one. So most of the activations happen at minus one and plus one. Right. Now, what is the problem with this? Well, again, no learning can happen because what happens now is that the gradient of the activation function with respect to X is close to zero because we are in the saturated regime where we know that the gradient of the activation function is zero or close to zero, right? So if I'm now back propagating gradients backwards through these layers, in each step, I'm basically multiplying a very small number here for the gradient of the activation function. And so the gradient of the loss with respect to all of the parameters um, uh, will not get updated. So what should we do instead? Well, um, what we should do is we should draw the weights still from a Gaussian distribution, with, but with a, a properly set standard deviation or variance. And how should we set the variance? Well, um, Gloreau et al. Um, have proposed to draw these weights um, from, and, and also they draw them independently. So each value is drawn independently as before, but they draw it um, such that they um, are anti-proportional to the number of input neurons. So the standard deviation or the variance is one over d in, where d in denotes the dimension of the input to the layer, which may vary across layers, right? So maybe we have a hidden layer with 100 neurons and then one with 200 neurons. And so the input to the 200 neuron layer is uh, d in equals 100. 
and then the input to the next layer is d in equals 200 and so on. But what happens now is, as you can see, is that the activation distribution is now well scaled across all layers um, and it stabilizes. If I would plot more layers here on the layer five, layer six, you would see that they would all um, show a very nice uh, bell-shaped curve that stabilizes in a, in a nice regime. It's never saturated. Um, it's, it's all in the, in the non-saturated region of the tanh function. Um, nor is it collapsing to a very small uh, area around zero. So why is this sigma um, equal one over uh, square root of din or the variance equals one over din a good choice? In order to see this, let us consider y equals g of wtx, so a single layer in the neural network, and assume <clears throat> that all xi and wi are independent and identically distributed with zero mean, and that further <clears throat> the derivative of the activation function at zero be equal to one. And this is something that's true for most activation functions. Think about the ReLU, it's one. Think about the, well, okay, it's, it's one for slightly positive values, but think about the um, the tanh function is also one, for instance. So the slope at um, in, in the central region of the tanh where we want to operate is one. It can be considered as a linear function there. So what happens then to the variance? If we consider the variance of the output, then the variance of y, because we have g as a roughly linear function with slope one, is uh, roughly equal to the variance of, of its argument, wtx, because we assume this linear slope one relationship. Now, because we have assumed that all of the w's and x's are independent and identically distributed, we can um, rewrite this as the variance of um, one individual element, xi, wi, times din. We'll just basically have to sum over all xi, wi, but because they are the same, we can consider a single one multiplied with the input dimension. Yeah, now um, we can rewrite this uh, variance um, as such. And uh, because x and w are independent, we can, uh, we can um, basically separate the expectation here. Right? So this is just um, manipulation using the assumptions here and the definition of the variance. And then because the um, we've assumed that the xi's and wi's are zero mean, these two expressions here are zero. So we are left with this expression here. And again, because we assume a zero mean distribution, then um, the expectation of xi square is equal to the variance of xi. And the expectation of wi square is equal to the variance of wi. And so what we can see here now is that in the case where the variance of wi is equal to one over din, so it cancels this term here, that in this case, the variance of y is equal to the variance of xi. This is what we want. We want the variance, the spread, to not change across layers. We want it to stabilize, to stay constant. And that's the reason why we choose the variance of wi equal to one over din. Now, if we do this for the um, tanh, this works very well, but if we do it for the ReLU, it does not. Um, so here we have used this so-called Xaver initialization um, also for the ReLU, um, but the ReLU, uh, this, the Xaver initialization assumes zero centered activation functions, which the ReLU is not. And so for the ReLU, the activations again start collapsing, as you can see here. So the distribution gets more and more skewed. It doesn't collapse as quickly as we've seen before, but it gets more and more skewed. And so what has been proposed in, in this paper by Heyerdahl is that um, instead of using this, um, this expression that we've seen before, we are just doubling the expression. So instead of one over DIN, we use two over DIN. And the intuition behind this is very simple. 
because the relus are restricted to positive outputs, the variance um, must be doubled, right? Because it, it doesn't capture the left half plane. And so all of these elements here are uh, zero frequency, right? There's no activation. It's either zero or um, something positive. And now the activation distribution is uh, well scaled across all layers, as you can see here from the illustration over histograms over different layers. So in summary, it's important to do data preprocessing and weight initialization. For data preprocessing, um, zero centering the network is important for efficient learning and uh, decorrelation and widening are used less frequently. Regarding weight initialization, um, this is really important. Proper initialization is really important for ensuring a good gradient flow, ensuring that the gradients are flowing back to all the parameters that we want to update. And for zero centered activation functions, we can use the uh, Xaver initialization. For ReLU activation functions, we use He initialization. And uh, initializ initialization is actually a research topic on its own with much more literature on this topic, which we are not able to cover in this lecture. That's all for today. Thanks.